This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. Huh? Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron. I'm your guest moderator for this evening. You can tell I'm the guest moderator because I'm much shorter and have less hair than Richard Fields, who's usually in this chair. Hi, and welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. We're so happy that you're joining us this evening. Hi, welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Uh, welcome to uh, Libertarian Counterpoint. I almost said uh, Libertarian Conspiracy because that used to be the name of it back when we had a little more fun. Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint, and thanks to Libertarian Party of Sacramento for being our sponsor. Thanks for our usual host, Richard uh, Fields, taking a little break, giving some of us a chance to try something a little different for a change. And thanks in particular for our guest tonight. And today we have our host, Richard Fields, with us. Richard, it's nice to see you again. Nice to be back. And I thought you were the host. No, I, as far as I knew, I was still in your seat. I was keeping it warm until you got back from your, from your world tour. You've, so. you've, been, you've been doing a fine job. I've been watching you from afar. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, your talent should be recognized. You too, John. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, uh, let me bring my wife in just to let her know that I do have a talent. She'd be surprised. Yeah, right. She's yeah. uh, working from home downstairs. Uh, my mother-in-law, I think, is out on the balcony. The dog is somewhere. We're, we're in serious lockdown here in the Cameron household. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's appreciative, actually. Thanks for coming from you, Mr. Fields. You've been here with Counterpoint for a long time. Um, it's We're entering our, what, our 30th year of production now with this show, 1500. And so that's a, that's a bit of a trip. Um, I'm the new guy. I've only been here, what, eight months. So maybe you guys can tell me a little bit. Both of you guys have been around a lot longer than I have. You know, maybe you guys can tell me a bit about the history that's of exactly. Libertarian. Well, I think Richard's a been... Go ahead, Richard. Well, I, I can tell you that it's not been counterpoint. it hasn't been Counterpoint for all that long. It started out as Libertarian consp Conspiracy back in, in, I think, 1989 or 1990. Get it exactly when. Back, 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 back. Bob Gale was one of the uh, of the pioneers, and uh, and Steve Hoverman was one of the the uh, studio pioneers. Uh, yeah, that was a Libertarian Conspiracy, and then somebody got the bright eye, and that for the spin for for the last I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when, but it was back in the 90s when the, the, the name actually changed. Particularly since last August. That's when I went on. Well, I don't know. I've, I've only been around, I think I started the show after I left uh, publishing, which would have been like 2004. And I think by then it had changed to Libertarian Counterpoint. I, I, I like the name conspiracy, but... You know, the, the problem with calling it libertarian conspiracy is that uh, a conspiracy requires more than one person, and you get two libertarians in the room, and they disagree with each other. They disagree with everybody else, too, but they disagree with each other. So there probably wasn't an accurate description to call it a conspiracy. But uh, it's been fun. It's been a great ride. I, I uh, really enjoyed I mean, Richard and I have known each other literally 30 I think 30, what is this, 31, 32 years. And uh, he invited me on to go on the show repeatedly. And for some reason I didn't um, for a long time. And then I did and, and uh, you know, they, they couldn't keep me off the thing because uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, had some, some wonderful guests, uh, especially enjoyed um, a lot of the, the learned people, the because of the the uh, deep state or regulatory state, whatever you want to call it, probably the the arena to do battle with those folks, unfortunately, is the courtroom. And so Richard and I were both fortunate enough to uh, work for. He put it longer than me for um, a nonprofit that uh, defended the Constitution against the government and. Uh, watching and listening to those brilliant attorneys who devoted their life to. Uh, really fighting for the Constitution uh, and uh, being on the show with them was was just was just wonderful. 
and uh, really enjoy the banter and the interplay and the fact that they, there were some smart people on there. And uh, uh, that, that, was, that was a whole lot of fun. And to do with some, you know, even though we say we're all in the libertarian camp, the libertarian is a pretty broad brush stroke way to, to, to uh, describe people. And, and some of the uh, some of the viewpoints are, well, probably mine are pretty radical. You know, I uh, um, some of the viewpoints were, were very exciting to hear. Uh, some of them I thought, oh, how quaint. But I didn't say that out loud, uh, you know. Because you you don't want to you don't want to uh, dilute the message by uh, just saying that somebody else is wrong. So anyway, Richard, are you, are you happy back? To me? Well, I think it's interesting. We're we're the uh, the one TV show that I'm aware of, really, in the entire country, or at least the longest running one in the entire country that actually speaks truth to power, uh, and uh, the the truth is quite often not politically correct. In fact, probably very seldom is it politically correct. So we have been the uh, kind of the voice in the wilderness calling out the uh, nonsense that you can print your way to wealth uh, using uh, central bank funding money. We've been the, uh, the uh, voice in the wilderness saying that uh, the climate changes, but it's not necessarily a disastrous thing for it to change. And most recently, I, I, you know, from watching you, James, we've been the uh, truth in the wilderness saying that the uh, coronavirus, the age of the coronavirus, uh, is not necessarily uh, a, uh, 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 a pathogenic or a virus pandemic so much as it is a uh, politically caused uh, uh, economic uh, pandemic. And that it certainly is. I have, I have some personal experience that I can share about why I believe that to be the case. I was in uh, Southern India, uh, first part of March, where the coronavirus was already starting to uh, be known to be in existence uh, at the time. So I, I flew back to uh, California uh, in the middle of March and was amazed to see that shortly after I left, the entire country of India on four hours notice shut down the entire economy people couldn't uh, the buses stopped the planes stopped everybody had to shelter in place and when i got to california i noticed that we're doing exactly the same thing as uh, india a third world country and the interesting thing from a personal experience was that i thought i had uh, coronavirus uh, coronavirus i thought there was a pretty good chance that i had it and i may have but I haven't been able to find out because tests were simply unavailable. I called the uh, Calif the uh, Orange County uh, Department of Health. I was staying in Southern California at the time. They wouldn't uh, give me a test. I called my uh, doctor up in uh, Northern California. He wasn't able to give me a test simply because they weren't available. And I've been beating my head against the wall in a Kafka-esque nightmare trying to get the test to find out whether or not I am uh, contagious to others. Not possible. Uh, and I'm sure that many, many other people have uh, also had a very, very difficult time trying to get tested. And it's simple arithmetic to know that if the denominator, the number of people infected, is small and the numerator, the reported deaths, is large, that the ratio of fatalities is way higher than is being reported on the various uh, news channels from CNN to MSNBC to NBC to CBS and all the rest, as well as New York Times and the Washington Post. So I think it's very, very easy to come up, come to the conclusion based on the few places outside the United States where they have done extensive testing, places like Iceland, where they tested at random 5% of the population and came up with a, uh, uh, a uh, fatality rate that's about eh, slightly higher than the or or ordinary flu, but not that much higher. So I think we've had a... Uh, uh, a uh, situation where the, the fear of the coronavirus is a hell of a lot more damaging than the fact of the coronavirus. And uh, you can argue that the, uh, the, uh, the virus is the uh, pin, the prick, the economic, really the debt bubble in the United States. Mm -hmm. Something was going to come along and prick that bubble. I guess it could, you know, it's just as well that it was the flu or the coronavirus. But uh, 
but it, we made the situation, the politicians have made the situation uh, an order of magnitude worse than it could be otherwise. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, I was just reading, I know the, that you guys already know these numbers. Uh, the most recent studies I read was one out of Santa Clara County and one out of, uh, was the USC LA County study and they did some randomized testing of thousands of people. And we came to the conclusion that based on those two tests, somewhere between 20 and I think 60 times as many people have the virus as uh, the confirmed cases, you know? And the only people they'll confirm are people who are basically deathly ill or, or ill enough to require hospitalization or, or intervention. So, you know, by doing that, and again, we'll bring up the word conspiracy, uh, they, they've basically made the fatality rate way, way, way higher than it is. And what's, what's really crazy, I had a friend of mine who still smokes, and uh, I was on, on, uh, on, on uh, BBC, and they quoted a, a study out of one hospital in France uh, where they, they noticed something very peculiar so they started looking at the cases that only 4% of the women who smoked, um, uh, of the people who came in and, and needed intervening care, only 4% of the female population that needed care smoked. And um, of the males, only 5%. And in France, uh, something like, well, I don't know, 53% of the males or something like that smoked. And so they came to the conclusion that somehow smoking basically helps prevent people from getting ill from the coronavirus. And you won't see you won't see that anywhere uh, in the states. I mean, it's just the the, uh, uh, the, the news media is really just uh, uh, loving this this panic. You know, I mean, we used to say in publishing business, what was it? If it bleeds, it leads. And the more it bleeds, the higher it is on the page. You know, above the fold and big 20-point type or 80-point type, that's where you put the, the horror story. And so, uh, you know, it's been great for getting click-throughs on pages and great for increasing the wealth of you know, all these people that are hanging on to the government and siphoning money off and great with the politicians for power. But... Uh, yeah, anyway, and that's, I think you're right. The, the coronavirus is basically just a, a very um, graphic example of over and over and over again how poorly government, especially uh, independent regulatory agencies, the quasi independent regulatory agencies, handle. Ah, now we've lost John. I think the internet decided, you know, John was getting fucking too long. Um, <laughs> but actually, that brings us back to the point about the, about the show. Is it's important that we have I actually give out our counterpoint. Yeah. This we've actually the pushback I received from some recent shows is is you guys are in an echo chamber. All you guys are talking to each other. And I said, well, all we have to do is turn on the TV to hear the, the our counterpoint. We don't get to live in a bubble like everybody else. Does. Yeah. And and I know it's been it's been a tough road for just keeping the show on. It's mm -hmm. been kind of a a, a bit of a roller coaster ride right it's we went from i know a few months ago we were they closed the studio down for a month in december for normal and then they had water damage so we didn't get into the studio until like late february and early march we had like literally one recording before they closed all this thing down for coronavirus and now we're trying to you know patch together shows called john cameron of the last minute trying to get you know a show 1500 together you know, uh, which I greatly appreciate you coming on, but it shows the, you know, the importance of the community that we're building. You know, it's, there is actually a community we're building. That's kind of the thing I've noticed. Yeah. That we actually do have a community. I've actually got run for office because someone noticed me in the grocery store and asked what libertarians were doing. Well, that's, that's kind of what the thing that pushed me over that. I, up until that moment, I had said, no, I wasn't going to do it. Yeah. And so when someone, so he wasn't even a libertarian, he was just some guy from my, so what are you guys going to do about this AB5 thing? Uh, well, I guess that means it's me, right? <laughs> and so it's been a heck of a kind of a a, a journey. I mean, because I'm trying to learn. I've, I've been doing this for a few months. Richard's being very kind, talking about talents and all that. But I've been doing this a few months. I haven't even learned how to keep the seat warm. And I'm getting thrown into trying to keep a, 
you know, trying to help get a TV show on air every week. It's, it's been a tried, bit of a challenge. Well, congratulations on making it happen. Because it was, you know, it's hard enough we, we you know, jokingly, um, you know, the studio now, I remember the old studio, and I think this is like the third, third or fourth iteration is, you know, it's a modern day vulnerable, you know, compared to the old studio, it's like the bridge of Star Trek, you know, and, uh, and but having the, the completely volunteer crew, everybody volunteer, volunteer cameramen, volunteer, all the people that come on, they're all totally unpaid, the people that do the engineering, Gail, Morgan, especially, bless them, um, you know, doing all of it, it is a community, like you said, and I think it's, it's wonderful that, um, you know, people are, are willing to stand up and be counted. And um, um, anyway, I think Gail said uh, he started in 2000. It was already named Counterpoint. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh. Can't hear you, Richard. We've lost Richard's voice. <laughs> Richard's lost his voice. Oh, no. Well, I... <laughs> well, I do know that... I don't, I don't get any of this done without uh, Gail and Lee poking me. And I think Brad has been in the studio even longer than Gail. So we have to give Brad, you know, the, the biggest congratulations for the long term, mm -hmm. for the long term uh, well, service to the show. And we've do got a couple new guys to the show, Charles Adams and Mitchell Just, my, my son. He's actually joined the show and been helping out in the studio when we can get in there. And so I don't know if uh, Richard's had the opportunity to, to meet him. Um, but you know it's we keep growing i know charles was just part of the access sacramento class that i was attended to get certified for the studio and he came in to certify and he's been joining us ever since and so it's and that's he's not a libertarian so there's actually there's some kind of community there that we're building that we have built over we have built i guess i say it, it is we now huh yeah. that, that you guys have built over the last 30 years and i greatly appreciate that and for that, I think we have a guest to join us here. Gail Morgan, our producer, will join us. Gail, how are you today? I'm doing good. <clears throat> been, uh, I've been uh, taking care of some things, but keep my eye on you guys. Um, as John said, I started in about 2000. Art Tumor was the curator of all things back then and, and making the show go. Um, recruited me to be a libertarian, uh, recruited me to run for office, and recruited me to run a camera. And then uh, they were having some problem with the CG machine. I don't know if Richard remembers that. Uh, Dave Henderson, that should ring a bell for a few people, was running CGs. And finally they said that uh, they wanted me to come in and rescue the CG machine. And uh, that's when I got my Permanent seat, 10 years I did CG. Now I'm the director for most of the time. But uh, hey, it's great to have Richard and John back in with us. I don't hear you anymore. I, your mic might not be working there, Richard. Yeah, we'd love to. Coronavirus has snagged Richard's voice today. It seems that we know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's going to be take a lot more than the coronavirus. I think it's a technical difficulty. Well, we'll have to get him back and do show 1501 so he can actually give us his whole story on this coronavirus issue. Uh, once he gets, I know he's working off cell phone connections. Once he gets his, he's back home. So that's actually nice to have Richard back home. Yeah. Well, welcome to California, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I will mention that uh, Yolo County is one of the most locked down counties in, in uh, California right now. So... Um, not hearing you, Richard. Not hearing anything. No. But I'm sitting at the desk where I do the editing. And so I usually sit here and take the, the show and take it from 29 minutes and condense it down to the 28 and a half that we have for the show. And I tag the, tag the, uh, intro and the exit on it so like that extended opening and there'll be an extended closing today uh, i get to sit here and put all that together so that's the behind the scenes that's the part i enjoy um i try to stay on the other side of the camera 
uh, rather than to look at it and say hello. But uh, it's fun. It's been fun. Well, and no, it's, it's – uh, is Richard back? You might want to leave and come back in and see if he picks this up. Let me see if I can get – can... do we get you now, Richard? No. No? No. Well, we get kind of an echo. It's like almost. Yeah. He's almost there. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure we'll have a lot to say after the show. We'll have to get together and have that drink. I'll text you after <laughs> after this is over. I just want to I want to talk a little bit about Richard, if I could. Oh, uh, sure. You know, Richard has been because um, I think for about three months I tried to fill Richard's shoes like pretty much full time, and I was exhausted it doing it three months and working you know full time ish there we go. and uh it was just exhausting and then richard has done it for well, how many years richard hold up hold up fingers i don't know 20 25 20 20 years 20 years and i think and i you know i think he's 30 he's done it for 30 yeah yeah. Well, anyway, he's done it a long time, and and uh, he's always uh, got good guests. He's always uh, got great issues. Um, he, you know, he, I don't think he ever missed a, a show due to illness or anything like that. I missed a couple because I'm wimpy, but uh, that I was scheduled for. And uh, he's, you know, year in and year out, kind of the rock of the the talent side and the, you know, making sure that that we actually had um, topics. That and you know his segue from topic to pot topic was wonderful, and I just you know thoroughly commend you and applaud you. I uh, for uh, yes, years I, and years and years of service, and at a very high level too. And it wasn't you know I I know you know Richard's like me's you know four o'clock in the morning kind of guy, and I know I'd get an email from him sometimes. I wouldn't open it because I'd be asleep at like 1130 at night when he was finally putting everything together and had everybody dialed in and all the rest of that. And then we'd go out after the show, typically, uh, I think almost always, and have a drink. And, you know, that would that would be starting at four in the morning and then doing the show and having a drink. And that's that's a very, very long day. But uh, we did it for for, you know, 30 years. So I'm uh, I'm I'm proud to call him friend and very, very very pleased with the results. So uh, anyway, well, we've got about two minutes left. Yeah, we got about we've got a couple minutes left, and um, I guess we should talk about where we're going in the future. Um, I know we started community podcast, so anytime you, John, want to come on and host a podcast episode or be a guest on an episode, you can contact me, or we can get it done real quick. It's nice and easy. Okay. The same thing for you, Richard. You are always the host, as far as I'm concerned, Richard. So. Uh, it's you know i don't know what your future is so until you decide you're no longer the host you are the host and i can go back and behind the scenes and do what i do or be a guest and that's you know we always have the, i've got the podcast side to do and we've got i actually had a conversation the other day um dale's gonna be the first time he's heard of this there was a conversation about starting a libertarian roku network and about us maybe putting counterpoint on that and it's less than a week old and we know who knows how these things go. So we'll, but there's, things are growing. We're getting noticed kind of around the, around the, the country. I'm trying to get more libertarians to get us on their uh, public access network. Right. It's, I don't know why we don't do that. It seems to be a missed opportunity. And that's kind of the future that I'm trying to help counterpoint, kind of put my stamp on the next 30 years. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. So, once again, Richard. Richard is silent. No, I. I think you know the the more the merrier on this stuff. I'd love to do a podcast or a vlog or whatever you call it. Um, uh, like to get uh, some of those sharp attorneys back on again. Uh, yeah, because they're you know I'm politically connected, so I do all politicians. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, um, uh, politicians. Are who have blogs and vlogs. A uh, lot mm -hmm. of our podcasts, if you will, are going to be made so they can be uh, exported to an audio format and be done also on a video format. So YouTube 
will carry some of them. And so uh, James has another place they will be appearing available on iTunes and other places. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. The virus has thrown us into the digital age, and we're moving ahead with it. And that the is digital age. All right. Well, it is. You know, it's there's really no the, with you know with YouTube and 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 software like this, and everybody having a camera and you know. Yeah. We are out of time, John. I apologize, but we'll have to get you on for fifteen oh one. And thank you all for watching. Thank everybody who has ever participated in Counterpoint in the past. I I love each and every one of you, and please visit. LibertarianCounterpoint.com and social medias and do all of that great stuff. Thank you for watching and please remember to love everybody. Congratulations, Libertarian Counterpoint, on making it to 1,500 shows spreading ideas of markets and liberty in Sacramento and the greater World Wide Web. My name is Jason McPhee. I'm an occasional host and guest on the show. I'd like to give a shout out to all those in the Libertarian community who've done so much to make this show happen in that time. A uh, special shout out to Gail Morgan, Richard Fields, uh, James Just, and Leo Welter, who have put so much time and effort into making this show happen week in, with, week out. Without their uh, tireless efforts, uh, I doubt this show would be possible. I'd like to give a, an extra thanks to Lee Welter as well, because uh, without him, I never would have made any connection to the show. I met Lee in a philosophy group, and it quickly became apparent that we shared many of the same values on markets and liberty. Lee's an all-around great guy, and thanks so much, Lee, for connecting me with the show, and I look forward to the next 1,500 shows of Libertarian Counterpoint. Anyway, we're coming to the end. Thanks for joining us, folks. Um, come back again. You can see us on uh, uh, Comcast Cable, Channel 17, uh, 8 o'clock. Oh, thank you. Thursday. Thank you. Noon Friday, 4 a.m. Saturday. That's John Cameron's favorite time for watching the show. Okay. I know I do. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, and, and you'll be able to check this show out on, on YouTube in probably about a week. Well, that's it for the show, guys. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and I thank you so much for being with us this evening. I thank Tanya Callens, her wonderful information on SB 276 and 277. I'd like to thank my loving husband, Mark Olson, for being here and being supportive. Catherine Duran will be with us next time. Please catch LCP on Access Sacramento, Channel 17, Thursday at 8 p.m., Friday, 12 noon, Saturday, 4 a.m., my favorite, and of course, YouTube under Gail Morgan for a Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is Pamela Olson. I'm very happy to see you. See you next time. Goodbye. And Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> You're going to say it again. <laughs> That's the show. We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place. I'm a libertarian kind of boy. Thank you very much for being here. And on that note, we're getting ready to tune out. I want to thank you very much for uh, being my guest. And uh, Richard, wherever you are, I hope you're enjoying yourself. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.